Hi everyone, Ricky Martin here, founder of Hyper Recruitment Solutions. We're here at the Recruiter Ricky podcast with no other than Julie Dean of the Cambridge Satchel Company. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I have been, we had a chat before, I've been desperate to speak to you after I went through your story and I've already told you five times how inspirational in six years you got an OBE. So we'll come back to that. But do you want to just tell everyone a little bit about your brand just to familiarise our viewers with your brand? Okay, so... Um the Cambridge Satchel Company was was set up with uh, speed of the essence. So um, I was based in Cambridge and I sold satchels. So <laughs> I kind of like that's where the name came that's from. Where the name <laughs> yeah. came from, and it was just to to bring back a bag that everybody kind of recognised, but it had fallen off the radar a bit. Um, it was set up very much just with the the purpose of of getting my kids into a good school yeah and and I think that the the big thing for me was um, in many ways it's gone a different way it didn't have the business plan it didn't have all these things you're supposed to have because it was set up to make school fee money and uh, it started out with me thinking these are bags that people will use for school again it ended up with um, people like Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift sort of carrying them. So it sort of went a little bit off piece, but in a, a good bit. way. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you think about it, you've, you've got to remember, how I see it, 2008 is when you came up with yeah. this idea. Yeah. Um, and I think in 2008, if I consider I started bubbling with the idea of setting my firm up and it took me a while, you had every reason in that year to say, it's too expensive to get a satchel company to the market with the cost of goods. And you did it on just 600 pounds. Yeah. So at that point, what was the burning passion to say, let's get going quickly, let's get it there? What, what really made you do that? It, it was my daughter having a miserable time in school. And you know, they, Emily and Max, they were uh, six and eight, and she had really just stopped wanting to go to school. She got so introverted, and so it, something had to be done. So um, it, you're never as good as when you've got the right motivation. And, and for me, the motivation to get them into a brilliant school was and so the time scale was the school holidays <laughs> yeah and it was 600 pounds and it was literally what can I do to make school fees so it was a list of 10 ideas it it wasn't like I was put on earth to make satchels so the idea ultimately is I want to get into a great school yeah if I can make money reasonably quickly and something I'm interested well, I have to in. yeah um, is it a case of I mean I I don't know the cost of if I in 2008 what kind of the brand satchels would be at the time was an element of the cost of the bags was it such a high price point that if you could make a better price bag you can make money no quicker? the satchels were not on the radar because I'd uh, when I came up with my list of 10 things I can do to make school fees that was actually the excel spreadsheet name okay <laughs> dot xls um it, it was what have I looked for over the last few years that I have not been able to find or what what have I tried to do because I think it's being done really poorly and then it was just about what's going to bring the right amount of cash in at, at the right and time. You did say there were 10 things. Yeah. Where was that listed on the 10? Oh, the position on the list yeah. was unimportant <laughs> because they were all ranked yeah. and there, there were columns going across and it yeah. was everything from how much money do I need to get started, when will the cash start coming in, what happens if I have a heart attack trying to do it, so the true can it carry on without me? Applied a process yeah, to actually... it, it had to be a process. It was very logical. And dare I ask whether they're top secret or whether they're in prototype, what were some of the other ideas? Oh no, they are top, top, top secret. <laughs> <laughs> just in case things go pear shaped, they're top secret. Um, uh, there's there's two of them that other people have done in the meantime, and, yeah. and, and they've worked out for them. But but the other ones are, are, are sort of top secret. But it it was one of these things that I just could not stand. I I don't like things that don't last. Mm. You know, when you buy things, and I remember I had a satchel at school, and it was just something I didn't have to think about every day. You just, you, you go to school, you put your books in your bag, your homework in your bag, and you go. And, and then it was just becoming with Emily and Max. It was, oh, these bags that didn't last, or the zips go, or, or you buy some cheap thing and it's got high school musical on it, and then they don't like it anymore, and then you've got to have a new one. I didn't have any of that. I just had my satchel for like 10 years. And if we now, if we think you had your satchel for 10 years, and yeah. let's think you started the firm in 2008, 
and yes, we're 2019 now, but that, we're pretty much 10 years on. Yeah. When you've gone from a 600 pound, I just want to make money quickly to get the children into a good school yeah. because they're not happy. How is the business kind of 10, 11 years on from Well, that? the one thing I would say is it's about 10 years on and I've still got one of the first satchels that I use for my brilliant. work bag and it is absolutely and brilliant. It's so it's, yes, and, <laughs> yeah. and actually it's got another good 10 years in it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I look now and it, it got Emily and Max to the school. Didn't, Max has just had his A-level results that was last Thursday. So he's, he's off to university, so it's got them off on the runway. So it, it did what I set out for it to yeah. do. And I think that, for me, one way that I manage to handle stress and risks is just by looking at it and thinking, what does what does success is an overused horrible what does success look like but it is important to think Cambridge Satchel was set up to send them to a good school Correct. it's done that so whatever happens it's a success and that makes me brave enough to take some pretty big leaps forward and so once that was done I had to decide well it's done that what do I want it to do now and and for me British craftsmanship and making things I love making things and not everybody wants to work behind a screen not yeah. everybody wants to work in digital or you know do stuff they like to see that they've got skills and they can make something they're really proud of and so providing jobs making great stuff and then it's it's just so much fun when you see somebody like Helena Bonham Carter was carrying one of our bags and wow. um We've had such incredible Taylor Swift dancing on her Instagram with one of our Twistlock bags. And to be able to take that Instagram, that video, and show people in the factory in Leicester and say, look, you made this. Yeah. You know, you, you did this. Steve was the guy who cut out the pieces for it. And then we had, you know, just going around saying this is with this person because what you made was so great. Then, then that's just a fantastic feeling. And why wouldn't you want to take it and do as much good with that as you can and to grow it as much as you can? And if we think of, if you follow the story through there, you're determined to get it off the ground. Yeah. You've clearly still got the passion and the determination and mm. the optimism to say, let's see where it goes, yeah. which I think is great. How have you been able to keep that for so long? Because once they're in school, um, and things are going well, and all these celebrities and great people were buying the product and having yeah. them. What still kept you driving? Because you, you love this product, and that's I just what love I love. It. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is the best company ever. Yeah. Um, it's Cambridge Satchel is literally my third child. Okay. You know, two of them have done really well, and they, they're off to university, but Cambridge Satchel is the child that still has to perform. Yeah. And yes, it's done great things, but not compared to where it could be and not compared to, you know, so so this is the one that's going to get overparented now that <laughs> Max has left the building. I think he's really <laughs> relieved. <laughs> but at least you keep someone in the nest, right? You keep well, exactly. This one home. is not going out of you the nest. You can keep an eye so, whether you yeah. let them loose on social media. Well, that, that's, <laughs> the, that's the thing, you know, if you, you just genuinely love the business so much, when you see it attacked, it makes you so angry. Mm. You think, well, no, you're not doing that you're not the manufacturer that rips you off no we're not having that we'll start a factory yeah you know somebody comes out with some some fake version it makes you really really angry and I think that you've you need that businesses that lose their founder often are the ones mm. then that go off the ball I think what's most powerful about that is losing the pace setter in a company losing the founder the person who loves it as much as them will is really really great when people join but there has to be other reasons other than just you love it that much that you've been able to have the successes um and if we think of our the people listening they'll either be job seekers thinking yep. how do they get up the ladder we'll either got people who could be in work thinking how do i set up a business and you are an inspiration for somebody with here's 600 pounds and in six years time, I've got this business with all these celebrities and I've got myself an OBE. And I know that sounds like impossible to some people, but you live in proof it is possible. Yeah. But can you tell me a bit more about getting the OBE? Because I think that is such, such an amazing accolade for anybody to be awarded an OBE. Could you talk to me about how that came about? It is. Um, 
I, I'm not entirely sure how um, how that whole thing works still, but I think that one thing about the Cambridge Satchel story and and my story with it is that it did start with six hundred pounds, mm. and I didn't come from a family with money, and I didn't have a fantastic sort of Rolodex great network of people that could help. And so it is one of those stories where this this had to start from from the house with an idea and n- not much of a clue about the industry and how to do it. But it does go to show that stuff can happen um, and that you do need that passion to keep bouncing back because things do knock you back. Yeah. Um, and so when it when it started taking off, it's it's just that. Emily and Max needed to go to a great school. This, that meant the schools in the area that I looked at, the one I chose that I thought would be brilliant for them was a private school. And it costs what it costs, and it's blooming expensive. Yeah. And so, you know, that that's a huge incentive. Yes, I had to learn to code and do the first website in like three days and be up and running because I didn't have that much time to faff around and and I'm now the um, entrepreneur in residence for the British Library okay. and when I so I see a lot of people starting up their businesses and where I was really lucky was that I didn't have all the time in the world to read another business book and do research and watch another podcast about how to start something and and sit watching programs about how to start my bit I just had to crack yeah. on you know because I didn't have that long and I didn't have like a million in startup money to waste on branding agencies and all this kind of thing. I just had to do yeah. it. And sometimes it's it's real pressure that makes you just get on with it because otherwise time can be really wasted. Well, I think the thing that I notice all the time when I'm speaking to people looking to start up a business or in school thinking about the future It is that I need to have all of these ducks in order before I do this. I need this qualification. I need this money in the bank. I need this security. And actually, the people I think are most successful are those that are just that they're just doing it. Yeah. They're getting it done. Yeah. They're not worrying about all the things that can go wrong. And they're actually more optimistic about all the things that could go right. Yeah. And stay motivated. I think what's nice you, you've overlaid on top of that is that personal motivation. And it's so important, you know, to have a passion about what you're doing is so important and I would say vital because things will go wrong. They'll go wrong. So how would you, if we think of from a job seeker side, I think we we mentioned that what's important is setting the pace, but when somebody joins your business, they're going to be very bought into you and your story and and, and what the business has done and what it could do. How would you keep them wrapped up into that? I'm not going to call it a fairy tale because that's unfair, but how would you keep them into the the dream and the passion you have? Because you can't be there every day. How have you been able to create people staying with you for a long tenure and driving for the success that you want? I think because um, I sort of, and I, I sort of, I involve people okay. in exactly what's happening, not just putting them in a little box and saying, this is your area. I'm not going to ever talk to you about anything other than digital marketing because okay. that's your area. And so I think that there's a great awareness within the team, everybody knows what's going on. Everybody knows which shop just had a great day. Everybody knows which product is is sort of the hero product, wherever they are. And um, I only hire people that will go outside of their area to help somebody else okay. if, yeah. if they need something else done. And how would you, I guess we're diving into that hiring side of our discussion now, but how would you identify that? Because a CV can only tell you a certain amount of yeah. things. How are you able to identify the person who can, I know this is my job, but I can do these things and I've done that. How do you identify that in someone? I, I, and I still interview so many, you know, most of the people that we hire. Because you can tell that. you're directly involved in that interview yeah, now. Great. Yeah. Um, because I, you can just tell it from the person. Yeah. You know, hopefully, although I would say some of my worst hires have been the ones that interviewed best. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so there's a, this, it's a quirky company. It's not the big corporate, it is a quirky yeah. company. So on our job ads, if you're working in um, in Cambridge, in the Cambridge Satchel sort of offices, 
and I think in the in the London office as well, it'll say on the advert, you must like dogs. Okay. I, in, and there's a really practical reason for that because I've got two very big dogs. I like the dogs to come to work. And if somebody can't cope with the dogs being around, if it's a choice between them and the dog, it's really unlikely. <laughs> so if they, you see, almost, rather than getting to the point of saying, does anyone have allergies because I bring my dogs in? You're almost setting a precedent from day dot that you have to like dogs and be comfortable yeah. and you're always not for you. Otherwise, don't be miserable. Yeah. You know, because the dogs are going nowhere. Okay. <laughs> you know? I think I made that mistake. I remember once. So we, my wife and I would love to have had a dog, but we're yeah. never around. So we've got cats. We just love animals. I remember once we brought a new cat into the house and we've got a handful of them. We're crazy. Um, and I said to the guy, I'm going to bring this kitten in for the next week. It's going to yeah, come yeah. in. Yeah. Three people in the business were like, I'm sorry, I've got an allergy to cat hairs. And I'm like, where do I go from there? Because I haven't set the precedent early. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so you know your priorities. Oh. So, so the first time when Cambridge Satchel moved from outside the house yeah. into our first office, it was to an office where I was uh, allowed to take my dog. Dog friendly office, yeah. Um, because when things are stressful, I really need my dogs there. Yeah. You know, it, it's just really grounding and, and I just love having well, them around. I've been sent three articles, I think, this week from staff saying... Do you know that bringing pets into the work increased productivity in the yeah. workplace yeah. because people are happier? Yeah. Um, one of the guys sent it who has a nice house rabbit and he wanted to bring the house rabbit in. So um, yeah. maybe next time you're here, I'll show you around our, our farm of an well, office. Definitely. And we've <laughs> got like we've got a WhatsApp group at work of yeah. people who like to bring their dog into work. And they, you know, they coordinate who's coming in, what days. And, yeah. and the WhatsApp dog group is, you know, it's an active group. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's think about hiring. I think that's one thing I'd really like to, to help people with. And I, I break the hiring down into easy segments to applying to a job, the CV, interviewing for a job, the interview. Yeah. And once you're in the job, what the experience is like. And I think I know part of the experience thing with you because you set a precedent of passion and determination. If we think of a CV, if I was applying to a job at your firm and yeah. I'm comfortable with dogs and I believe I've got the skills. And that's the thing read the advert correct read the job advert if the job advert says must like dogs and then you turn up and you see this dog and you hide in the toilet so you're 10 minutes late for your interview probably not going to work out you wouldn't want them anyway i guess we'd look at it but like that's that. happened mm. you know it's like where is this person they're in the toilet because the dog is outside <laughs> I was like, well, we didn't read the advert. Well, at least that way you read saved yourself the, the surprise. Read the advert and just think, I would say, when you read the advert, think, is this actually a job that's going to make me happy? Before you even think about the CV, is this a job that is going to make me happy where I can learn something? This might not be my forever job. Why am I applying for this job? Because if you can't answer that then for good places and good jobs, you know, you need to be able to show that you really want it. I think really the really it. important thing you've just added into that discussion is it doesn't need to be my forever job. No. I think, and I say this a lot, particularly of people building their career. Don't imagine that the job you're going to get today is the job we'll be in in 20 years' time. No. The jobs for life, not saying that people won't have them, they aren't as prevalent as they used to be. And I think, don't think you're going to be the CEO of Facebook today. Yeah. Join a business in the skills that will get you there. Yeah. Um, so, and what would you say with that in mind, knowing that they might not see it as the job for life and as much as you'd want to retain and keep them, what to you is a reasonable length of tenure with your firm in a particular role before they move up the ladder, move sideways? It sort or of depends on? what they're looking for at the okay. time. Because I think that, you know, we could get somebody and it's their first job um, after school or their first job after university or whatever, and they really love maybe, say, social media. Mm. That's their big passion. And they're brilliant at it. Then maybe they'll be with us for a year. You know, maybe it'll be two years. But then they will have given us what we needed at that time and they need to go off and do something fresh maybe they've then decided that they've found that they have a love of sustainability and they want to go back and get a qualification in that and work in that area or okay. whatever but all I would ask is that while you're with us you give it everything What's interesting is I do think that part of the recruitment process is loss which is that pure honesty which yeah. is 
I know it's brave to do it, but someone's sitting saying, it might not be for my forever job, but I can build these skills. I'll give you everything in this period and we'll get a great mutual relationship. Yep. And you're open to say, okay, let's see how that goes. And yeah. I think when people come in and say, in five years, I'll be your manager and 10 years, I'll be one of your directors. And then they go in six months. Yeah. It's a bad hire for everyone. So you're probably uh, glad to see them go there. Then. You probably are. And you're yeah. probably, you knew that when they turned up on day one. That well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> oh. but, but, but I look back and I was a waitress in a Greek taverna for like three months. Um, I got a lot out of that. Was it going to be my forever job? No, but I'm really glad I did it. I had a great time doing it. I learned so much. Um, And then after uni, I I joined Deloitte and I qualified as a chartered accountant. There were some really desperately miserable, boring days in there. Yeah. But that training made it so that when I came to do the accounts and payroll and all that kind of thing, I understood every part of those financials um, and I understood the importance of cash flow and I'd seen business problems and it was absolutely a phenomenal grounding. And for the four years that I sort of was working, three years to qualify and then um, a year afterwards, it was just exactly where I needed to be and, and I worked with them for a year in, in America and saw different ways of doing things okay. and, and all that. Um, but I gave it my all. I had a great attitude. I gave it my all, you know. And, and I think that, and then I went on to sort of fundraising for my college back in Cambridge. And again, didn't really know what I was doing, but I really gave it my all. And I did, I did a good job. Um, and I just think that's the thing. Every single stage, your life is probably going to be in chapters. But you you owe it to the person paying you and you owe it to yourself to turn up every day with a great attitude and and then you'll both get something out of it you see it knowing how strongly you feel about that because i agree a hundred percent yeah i think my motto is just be the best you can be yeah you need to be the best at anything just be the best you can be at what you're doing have there been examples during your your, your business growth and your hiring of staff where you've had people who actually have disappointed because they haven't given it their all and are there any examples you can share? Yeah, I think they do. People just, you know, they let themselves down and then I really come across as the mum. You know, it's like, you've disappointed me. But it is your it's child, like, oh, so you're going to mum. It's like, you disappointed me and I think you've let yourself down, you know. Yeah. And I think that there is, there are the most disappointing times are when you hire a person because you see something in them and you believe in them and then if they turn up and they realize very early on that they're in a place that doesn't penalize somebody that's going to try something different to come out with a beige safe middle of the road kind of performance I think that's really disappointing. So you've given them the platform to take a Do risk something amazing, to... you know, do something shocking. And because it's, we were noticed first because we came out with those fluorescent bags and they were, they were shocking. I mean, you did sort of either love them or, or hate them. I would far rather that than something really safe and boring because you can get that sort of anywhere. And that's the same with people's performance. You know, you want to go in there and... And somebody gave me some, some great advice when I was working um, for, for Deloitte in the US. And they said, if you want to be a manager, if you want the, the job that your boss or your supervisor has, just start doing it so that people naturally see you, you know, in that role. Because it's not about job title. Mm. You know, it's it's about what you're doing. And if you're doing an amazing job and you're taking on all these other things without being asked because you think it needs doing and you've done a great job at it, of course you're going to advance. Because people are, are thinking 
about you in that kind of framework anyway. Well, you, you actually gave me a really good example of this before we started this podcast. And I'm going to bring us on to this, which is do something shocking and do something yeah. amazing mantra. Yeah. Um, and this is looking at an interview process where yeah. you were interviewing, and hopefully you're comfortable to share this, you were interviewing for somebody to do a digital role in your company. Yeah. And they turned up in an interview with a slightly different set of skills to offer. So would you mind sharing yeah. that with everyone? Because no. I think this is a great example of... I've gone in for a job, haven't got that job, but I've impressed enough to get a different job made for me. And it's about being brave. So, yeah, you so it was, that? it was to, um, I was interviewing for a head of e-com. So as digital as yeah. you can get to run our website and up the conversion and sales on the website. And in the morning I'd seen someone that I thought this is the person, this is great, ticks all the boxes, great attitude doesn't have as much experience as when I set up what I was looking for. I thought that I would be recruiting someone with more experience, but she was just so much better than the people with experience under her belt. So it's lunchtime, I'm happy. And, you know, I had loads of things to do. You know, frankly, I didn't want to do the afternoon <laughs> interviews because the, the box had been taken. It already chosen. But, yeah. you know, people turn up and everything. And so in comes someone for head of ecom who under their arm has got a scrapbook brilliant right so they've got this scrapbook everybody else had powerpoint presentations because it's a digital job of course no she's got a scrapbook lays down this scrapbook and it's just got loads of pieces like pictures and things cut out stuck in there's arrows there's all these comments they're all in different colors and there's like outrage this comments like outrage outrage this is not good enough you know underlined 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 and it's like this shouldn't be this way it should be worded this way this isn't good enough and I just been walked through this scrapbook and I just thought this person is is absolutely fantastic um and and it's the thing about it was th there wasn't a job that was open at that time for that person. But I knew that I couldn't let her go without hiring her. Um, and no, she was definitely not head of e-com. Who doesn't turn up to a digital role with a scrapbook, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's not <laughs> the head of e-com. Yeah. Uh, there was no PowerPoint presentation. There was no digital presentation. There wasn't a computer of any kind. You know, there were a lot of colored pens involved. But um, the, the passion and the brand voice and the understanding of... And, and so, you know, um, I had to create a, a position that that was uh, like a brand guardian. Yeah. You know, somebody who would have the voice of the brand, whether it was the copy that was on the website or whether it was the way the brand is presented in the shops or or whether, and so it was, yes, PR, comms, marketing, whatever. I didn't care what, what the job title was, but we needed her. Yeah. We really needed her. Because when your business is growing, your your brand is really important can be lost by taking on people you can be so so focused on filling a job to do this and filling a job to do this and filling a job to do this that you you somehow forget that actually it's the culture and the brand that's going to be vital and this person uh, was ideal for that I think you know just sort of the enthusiasm like dashed in past me into that room said, I love this brand. And you just think, wow, you know, uh, um, and it's one of the best hires I've ever made. Well, ironically, a significant percentage of the people I support with roles end up getting the role they never interviewed for because they've demonstrated the qualities the business looks for in their culture and the behaviorals. Yeah. They've either shown that they can be a great brand ambassador for the firm and be a representation and roles get created for great people. And I think this is the thing that a lot of people need to appreciate when they're going through the process. Go into the interview, be the best that you can be. Don't worry about you might not be best for that role, be the best you can be for the firm. And things come together and lo and behold, the person you hired is still with you today. Yeah. And you guys have a great relationship. Yeah, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic because you you go in and if you take the view this is a brand that i really love and i really care about whether or not they take me on 
this is my opportunity to tell them what I think they're not doing well enough. Yeah. No. And I really appreciated that. And maybe some hirers with less confidence and experience might not appreciate that. But, you know, I did that when um, I interviewed for my role as the development officer, first development officer for my college in Cambridge. And I thought, they're never going to hire me. You know, I don't have sort of like big loads of experience. I'm, I'm too young. I'm, I'm probably, I, I had a picture of who they were going to hire. But I thought, I've been shortlisted. I've got an interview. So I need, this is my slot because I deeply, deeply care about this place. Mm. And I want to tell them what I would like to see done as someone who does care about this place. And so it was, it, there wasn't really any expectation on my part to get that job, but I ended up getting hired and I think it's very similar. You've gone in with the optimism, the enthusiasm, the um, I'm going to take a risk. And not everyone knows, but I always look at my first professional role. I turned up in a company that were very suit and tie, no beard, smartly kind of smart hair, shiny shoes, a very corporate environment. I had just finished two weeks wrestling on the wrestling camps around the UK with a bleached mohawk, yeah. turned up in a beige suit with a bleached mohawk and no tie into a corporate firm, and I got the job. Everyone thought it wouldn't work, but I was there, but it's because you're prepared to go in there with pure humility and enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, if I take it back a step, I'm gonna look at the CV, cause, and I'll ask you some quick fire questions in a moment, but first thing when you have a CV put in front of you for whatever the role, what's the first thing you look for on that CV? I look to see what jobs they've done what I would like to see that nobody puts on the CV okay. the dream CV for me would be this is the job I did this is how long I stayed there this is what I loved about it and this is you know if I didn't stay there long this is why because I think that otherwise if it's just pure facts yeah. and you get the feeling that this is the CV they're probably sending to 100 places then not it's not tailored yeah. I want to know if there's a job on there that sticks out as different from the other jobs, why they took that. And if they've only stayed in places for relatively short amounts of time, why that is. Why they've moved from firm to firm. Yeah, but why don't people put down, you know, this is this is why I left? You know I would say percentage wise, yeah. Less than five percent put that on the C V. And it is 90% of the reason why the CV gets rejected by the hirer yeah. because they don't know why. And I think it's having the ability to understand. Um, how many times have you actually reached out to the person to say, there's something here in light in your CV, but I need to know these answers even before I interview. Does that ever happen? No, well, not very often because if you can't put personality into the CV, then there are enough people who can. And you've got so many CVs coming in that you, it's just a culling. And that's the key tip. It's like you've got one shot to make that impression on paper because yeah. you're yeah. only looking at words on the CV. And if you don't jump out, the others probably will and you might miss that shot. Um, what's the first thing you look for when you interview the person? So when they walk into a room and yeah. you see them for the first time, what are you looking for at like, that point? I want sparkly eyes and a big smile. <laughs> Okay. Otherwise, I just do not want to be seeing them on a Monday morning. <laughs> and can they? Uh, well, that's an important point because I always say that Monday mornings are powerful for any business because actually you want there to be energy and passion in your firm. And if yeah, you, you take the energy away from the company, yeah. the business is already struggling. No, you don't want that drain in the corner that nobody particularly wants. So how would they? Let's just say I've come into interview and I've had a really, really bad journey. And I know that's irrelevant to you and my CV got me to the interview. And I've given you that bad impression because I've run late and all these things. How do I get you back involved in the interview? How do I re-engage you once I've started so poorly? I think that you've got to put the energy in. Mm -hmm. You've really got to put the energy in. And you've got to own up to what you've messed up. You know, you've got to go in and say, I'm late to this. I completely understand that that's not acceptable. And you're probably going to feel like you never want to see me again. But um, I'm going to do whatever it takes to turn this around because I want this job. And this is why I want this job. Have you ever on that? Have you ever seen the film The Pursuit of Happiness? It's got Will Smith in it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And the reason yeah. I mention that is it has to me the epitome of what you've just shared. You've got a working father yeah. who's late to an interview for yeah. an internship where there's 100 interns yeah. covered in paint. Yeah. I think he's got no trousers on. Or yeah. maybe I've made that up. I'm not sure one of the two. 
in a corporate firm, there's every reason for them not to hire him. Yeah. And he gets hired, I mean, yeah. because he brings the enthusiasm to the table. And you've got to kind of own it. You, you mustn't be sort of like, let's pretend nobody's going to notice that I'm late to this. Yeah. You know, that, because everybody notices. In, in, and the first thing probably somebody's written is late on the top of the thing. So you've <laughs> got to come in with, yeah. with some real honesty and say, this is why I honestly believe I could do a great job here. Good. Well, I think what's important is, A, you like a spade to be called a spade, but secondly, you want yeah. people to, to bring the sparkle that you bring to the firm. And I think that's a, that, that is important for any company so when important. they're hiring. And if anybody is interviewing for jobs, they need to remember to bring the sparkle to that interview and bring the passion. Um, before we conclude, the last thing I'll ask, um, is there anything else in terms of your experience, your career to date, that's worth sharing that people can learn from to help them to, to get hired and help them in the future? Any last bits of advice? I would say beware networking events that are called networking events. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad I ran one last year called a networking that's event. Really Tell me more. Well, because only people with too much time on their hands go to networking events. <laughs> what if the networking event is outside of hours in an easy to get to location on the right topic? Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do that? No, your network is going to be so important. Yeah. But the people in your network that will help you are, are people that you will meet along the way. And don't think that just going and like shaking hands and they're people that you meet for a reason. So in my opinion, it's much better to try and single out the people you really want to meet, get a way of, of meeting them um, and, and building a network a quality network instead of a numbers network so if i can word it in another way build an organic network yeah not a false yeah. network. no don't buy yeah. your friends that's bad it's bad <laughs> it's bad and then i would say as well that it, especially in the early days nobody is expecting you to know exactly what you're going to do for the next 40 years or something yeah. it's unrealistic and so i'm a great believer in you know just wear a few hats you know volunteer for things get involved in things that you really really believe in and and make you happy because then if one thing doesn't work out you've got other things to fall back on and and it's just unrealistic to think putting all of your time and energy into one thing that might not be your thing mm. and it'll make you a boring person so don't hire boring people. I think no, don't hire boring people. Don't <laughs> hire people that that you would want to not sit by at the Christmas do. Yeah, ironically, as I say, that comes back to the Monday morning thing when you walk in and yeah. if you're boring and I we don't want to have a conversation, I'm never going to sit next. In fact, I'm going to go over there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for your pearls of wisdom. Um, I appreciate your story and I've said it three or four times. It is amazing and I can't wait to tell my wife that I found out more about your story and I've got the bag that she hasn't, so I can't yeah, wait exactly. to tell her. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.